All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, in honor of Open Education Week, we wanted to present our materials for Teach Syria and then sort of open up the floor for a bit of a discussion on open courseware within the social studies framework and um, a global awareness in the, in the case of a millennial audience. So um, just to give you guys a little bit of background, News Deeply is the organization that we're working for, and it was started in December of 2012 by our lovely founder who's here with us today, Laura Satrakian. Um, she was covering the Middle East and based in Dubai as a journalist for five years and noticed sort of a lack of in-depth coverage in, the, in foreign news. Um, so she came back to the United States and founded News Deeply, and the goal of News Deeply is to create single topic websites around complex global issues. And our pilot project was Syria Deeply, which you can find online, and we can put the, um, the web link on later. But underneath Syria Deeply, there are two different educational programs, which is um, what I do with Syria Deeply. I'm the Development and Educational Programs Manager. The first educational program is Syria Deeply on campus, and there are college-level group that's responsible for raising awareness, as well as a recent campaign that raised over $12,000 for refugee aid in, um, in Jordan. The other one is Teach Syria, and that is what we're going to show you guys today. I'm going to put into the little box the main link for the website, and there you can kind of follow along and see how the program looks, what the different collaborators are, and all of those different items. But we're going to go ahead and start by playing um, playing the first Prezi, which is basically an amped up PowerPoint presentation with audio and video and images. And this one sort of introduces the participants to what Syria is, what the background is, and those important items. So we're going to go ahead and push play. And then afterwards, we'll open up the floor for discussion. Here we go. Syria is a country at the heart of the Middle East. It's roughly the size of Missouri, which means the U.S. is about 53 times the size of Syria. Flying from the U.S. to Syria spans almost 6,000 miles. Syria has a population of over 20 million people. They mostly speak Arabic, that's the official language, but some people also speak Kurdish, Armenian, and Turkish in different parts of the country. The majority of Syrians are Muslim, with a minority of Christian and Druze and a very small, historic Jewish community. Syrians are famous for their music and their food, Mediterranean dishes like fatouche, kebab, and pahlava. The capital of Syria is Damascus. It's a multicultural city with ancient historical landmarks. So when did the country really start to make headlines? In March 2011, when the protests known as the Arab Spring were raging across the Middle East in countries like Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and beyond. Those protests inspired the people of Syria to rise up against President Bashar al-Assad. The Assad family has ruled Syria since 1963, when Hafez al-Assad took power. Since then, his political party, the Ba'ath Party, has ruled the show. When Hafez al-Assad died, he passed on power to his son, Bashar al-Assad. In all, his family has held power in Syria for five decades through a military dictatorship, a system that controlled the country. That system served the Assad family and its friends well, making them rich and powerful. But for the average Syrian, life has been hard. There's been no political freedom, a one-party system, no free speech, no freedom of conscience. And there's... Okay, guys, sorry. Apparently this wasn't, this wasn't going along with everybody. Is, can everybody see the PowerPoint now? Okay. 
Okay, sorry guys, this is... Okay. Yeah, that would be great while we figure while we figure this out, please. Should I jump in and talk a little about the history of the project and the objective while that's working out? Awesome. Well, thank you guys for your patience with the technology. My name is Laura Satrakin. Um, Kristen is my amazing friend and teammate at News Deeply. And like she said, I covered the Middle East um, for ABC News and Bloomberg Television for five years. Uh, my family is ethnically Armenian, so we're from the region originally. And uh, I was very, very inspired uh, by, frankly, the interest I was starting to see from young people in the United States to understand the Arab Spring, to understand the Green Revolution in Iran. Um, and, you know, doing a job I loved, being on TV every day, but feeling like there was a foreign policy literacy that we had to share as journalists and that we needed to find more and better ways to do that. So while we were focused on our startup, Syria Deeply, part of News Deeply, we really wanted to do something in education. We really wanted to share the content we were creating. Um, we wanted Syria Deeply to serve well in a public education function. And we met some incredible social studies teachers from Buffalo, New York, who wanted us to do just that, who wanted us to help them put Syria in their social studies class. So that's how all this kicked off. We uh, kept collaborating with them and then with a group of teachers with the guidance of the president-elect from the National Council for Social Studies and developed this set of materials focused on Syria um, and really with the mindset of helping explain what's happening in the headlines uh, to those who are interested but just happen to have not had the same experience or encounters with that culture before and, and really making it relevant, introducing folks to the people in behind the headlines and explaining why these, these people half a world away are fighting each other and dying every day. We hope uh, that it's useful. We hope we'd love your questions. We'd love your feedback. We'd love to explain why we're doing this. The fundamental mission is to bridge the newsroom and the classroom and to do it in a way that really enables you as teachers to, to talk about these subjects and to make them real and relevant. Um, so, you know, it's really a service project for us. It's an important part of our mission. And, um, you know, we're going to keep doing it. And we'd love to do it on different topics that people find compelling, from Iran to Pakistan to, uh, you know, everything from food security to climate change issues that really take a lot of, of a kind of background to feel like you're comfortable with. And that's what, uh, that's what we do. We do it as journalists. We continue to do it as we report on these parts of the world. But we wanted to make it part of what we do for a broader American audience to get a new generation interested in all this stuff out there. So that's the mission. And, um, you know, okay. Barry, um, I'll, I'll so talk back to Christian. I, I, know that I apologize to everybody. I am not the most technologically adept, of course, working at a technologically based company. But um, at, at any rate, I apologize that we can't see the video at this time, but if you go to the link that I provided in the chat, you will be able to see it. Um, at any rate, just to sort of talk a little bit more about, about Open Education Week and um, Creative Commons licensing and all of these important things that bring us together. Um, essentially, what we are one of our major goals through News Deeply, through Syria Deeply, as well as through Teach Deeply, is to promote global awareness. And one of the reasons why we've integrated technology into all of these different initiatives is because we're focused on a millennial audience. And, you know, in, in this day and time, as we grow more towards a globalized world, a globalized economy, those who don't fall in line with technology will kind of end up behind. And we're worried about that happening for American students, which is why we have put this um, put this at the forefront and why it it is focused towards middle and high school students to start that 
conversation earlier and you know, better prepare our students for life and work in the 21st century. Um, so hopefully this video will get, will get uploaded, but for the moment I would love to open it to the floor. Um, we'd love to hear your questions. We'd love to hear what you guys have been doing to bridge global awareness amongst an, a millennial audience and anything else that you may have on your mind. So please, shoot. Okay, so nobody has any questions. <laughs> yeah. can, can everybody hear me? Yes, no, maybe. All right. Well, um, have any of you guys been teaching Syria in the classroom as is? <laughs> Why question for them? Is this a relevant topic? Do you guys look to talk about this in the classroom and what, what global issues do you need? Yeah. Okay. If uh, if you guys want to type into the chat, um, we would also love to hear from you in that in that way as well. In terms of teaching globally, do you guys have any? Um, have any thoughts on on what other topics you'd like to see come up in the future from Teach Deeply? Such as teach a run, teach Pakistan, teach global water, teach I mean there there's so many different ways things and and projects that we could do. Oh, okay, we've got one question from get this information to teachers. If you look at the link that I posted um, on there, and I don't know if you guys can see this in my screen, but IamSyria.org is where we're hosting this at this time, and it's a, it's, it's this organization that is made by teachers, and they have a Facebook campaign called I Am Syria. And if you look at, um, basically, it's, it's just a website and we broadcast it through the NCSS. Um, Steve Armstrong, the president-elect, is our formal advisor. So we broadcast it through their systems. We sent it to a lot of similar organizations that do global education and that sort of thing. Um, so we just, you know, and one of the greatest parts about this, uh, Jason, is that it's been, um, people have been so receptive because it is Creative Commons licensed, which means that it's free for everybody. So, um, so people have been very, very willing to share with, uh, with us and post it on their networks and such. Um, now that we have the video, we're going to go ahead and play that really fast and then we can go back to the questions. Mary Lou, turn your microphone on. Is the audio on that on? Syria spans almost 6,000 miles. Syria has a population of over 20 million people. They mostly speak Arabic, that's the official language. But some people also speak Kurdish, Armenian, and Turkish in different parts of the country. The majority of Syrians are Muslims, with a minority of Christian and Druze very small, historic Jewish community. Syrians are famous for their music and their food, Mediterranean dishes like satouche, kebab, and paklava. The capital of Syria is Damascus. It's a multicultural city with ancient historical landmarks. So when did the country really start to make headlines? In March 2011, when the protests known as the Arab Spring were raging across the Middle East, in countries like Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and beyond. Those protests inspired the people of Syria to rise up against President Bashar al-Assad. 
Assad's family has ruled Syria since 1963, when Hafez al-Assad took power. Since then, his political party, the Ba'ath Party, has ruled the show. When Hafez al-Assad died, he passed on power to his son, Bashar al-Assad. In all, his family has held power in Syria for five decades through a military dictatorship, a system that controlled the country. That system served the Assad family and its elite friends well, making them rich and powerful. But for the average Syrian, life has been hard. There's been no political freedom, a one-party system, no free speech, no freedom of conscience. And there's been economic pain, a state-run system that has limited trade with the outside world, income inequality, a wide gap between rich and poor, and high unemployment, especially among the young. All that fueled public frustration. Fast forward to March 2011, when school kids in the southern Syrian city of Dera tagged the streets with graffiti, criticizing the government. Those kids were arrested and harshly punished. In reaction, it sparked an uprising around the country that lasted for months. The regime tried to control those protests with force, gunfire, and shelling, punishing the protesters with deadly violence. That led some of the protesters to fight back. They organized a rebel army, a loose group of fighting brigades. That meant that two sides were now doing battle in cities across the country. In July 2012, the Red Cross officially called it a civil war. That escalated into a human rights catastrophe. The regime is accused of torturing prisoners and targeting civilians in deadly air raids. As the conflict grew even more brutal, there were human rights abuses by both sides. On top of that, Al-Qaeda has joined the fight. The U.S. says that groups linked to the terrorist network are fighting against Assad for their own purposes, hoping to spread their influence. That poses a security risk to the world. The U.N. is trying to broker a peace in Syria, but world powers are split over how to do it. On one side, the U.S. and its allies want Assad to go. On the other side, Russia and others are providing support to Assad, keeping him in power. The fighting has spilled over into neighboring countries, along with streams of refugees who fled the country. Inside Syria, the war has left over 60,000 people dead. It's destroyed countless homes and damaged priceless historical sites. It's also left Assad and his supporters, part of the same minority religious sect, fighting for their political survival. In other words, some of Syria's religious groups have now become bitter enemies. All that makes it harder to end this civil war. There is still hope for the future. Many international organizations have responded to the Syria crisis, providing food and shelter to Syrian refugees until they can safely go home again. Around the world, people have united to support those caught in the crossfire. In the U.S., there have been campaigns to support Syrian refugees, and many people have written letters to their senators or state representatives to do more about helping those in need. Even kids are helping out, following the story in the news, and collecting donations for disaster relief. If Syria seems far away, you can always find ways to help in your own community. Ask your teacher or your parents what you can do to help people half a world away. So as you can see, that's, that's the basic way that we've chosen to explain this to a younger millennial audience. And it does sort of wrap up what's happening, where it is, how you can relate to it, what you can do. And we ran a teacher focus group around this to sort of to figure out what was lacking, what was not, when we had originally created this Prezi. And there are two fascinating feedbacks from middle and high school students was, one, background. A lot of kids in the United States had no idea what, what Syria was, where it was, who was there. Oh, do we like them? Do we not like them? So we had to put in a lot more background. And then the other feedback, which is so important during Open Education Week, during this discussion, is that it freaked a lot of students out. You know, they, they saw this um, 
this very large conflict in front of them and they didn't know how to interact with it. They didn't know what to do. How could they help? And as a result, when they were later discussing it, they said, oh, well, I want the U.S. to not be involved in this. I want us to pull back out. And because of that, we put in this last bit about this is what you can do. And if you go, um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but when you do go to the website, you can see that the way that we've structured this is um, you tie it into your class, where, wherever, whatever, it can tie into a authoritarianism, it can tie into government, it can tie into a whole bunch of different topics. Then you show this background that we've just saw, and then afterwards there's a follow-up presi about youth projects across America, and that's how we combated that, that fear of, of the other sort of thing, or the fear of the conflict. Then it is followed by PowerPoint slides and a worksheet, which at that age really does back up and reinforce the information that they've learned. And then following that, there's a presidential cabinet simulation where everybody is assigned a role from the UN, you know, Ban Ki-moon, Obama, Assad, and they ask the students, well, what do you want to do about Syria? And then that's followed up by a Common Core essay assignment. So that's the basic structure of it. And once again, there is, there is the link. And that's the distribution mechanism, Jason. Um, and it's also a fun way to sort of interact with, with, the, um, with the programs. Well, we had feedback. Um, we had feedback from the teacher, the teacher focus group. And we've also gotten a lot of emails about, oh, where can I find the materials? Oh, what can I do? But one of the steps that we have to take next is figuring out how to, how to apply a better monitoring and evaluation system. Because we know that over, I mean, 6,000 people in the first two weeks viewed the, these materials. Um, but we need to see more from, you know, how did their students like it? What were the questions that were raised? And we're working on that right now. Did anybody else have any questions about the presentation or about the format or how to get it to teachers or Common Core? Or... All right, and Laura, do you have any, any like, follow-up to, to the presentation or how it fits into deeply or? I think you've covered it all. I think the fact is that digital content can be so helpful and we, we want to make it as helpful as it can be uh, as journalists and practitioners of content. Uh, this is stuff that we can create really easily and our goal is to create the tools that are most helpful and most relevant. So that's our mission and uh, we're sticking with it. Indeed. <laughs> So if anybody has any final questions, we'll let you ask them now. But otherwise, we've, you know, we've sort of covered our end, and we're really grateful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, the teacher's guide is very, it's helpful in terms of explaining what our mission is, what the mission of the IamSyria.org people is. Um, and you can do that also on that link. To tie it all together with our story, uh, of, of how we all started. I Am Syria was started by those two social studies teachers in Buffalo who approached us for help on how to do this. So this was teachers coming up with a need and, and we really uh, we tried to respond as best we could. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Any, any time that you want to post it, please do. And if you do decide to do it in your classroom or if you know any teachers that want to want to do it in their classroom, please have them email me and ask any questions, any follow-ups. My information is on the teacher's guide. And stay in touch. We're deciding soon what to tackle next as a topic. Uh, we'd love your input going forward. Stay in touch when you can. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, but thank you all for for participating.